My name is Abdul Malik. I'm a Muslim from the United States of America. I've been practicing Islam for about 30 or more years, and I'm here to share with you my transition from the ignorant life of being a non-Muslim into being a Muslim. Uh, I would think that my transition started at a very, very early age, and it took several years before me to complete the process. Uh, my parents were both Christians. My father was a Christian minister. My mother was a Southern Baptist Christian. She was very devout, as were most of my family. Uh, we have many, many ministers in our family, and uh, they have churches all over America. So I was brought up in a strong, strong Christian environment and a strong Christian neighborhood. And I asked my parents when I was 10 years old, nine or 10 years old, how did Esau Ibn Maryam die for me when I hadn't been born? Because he had been dead for some 2,000 years. How did he die for me? And I lived in a, a, a city where there was a lot of crime, a lot of violence, and I used to see people getting shot, killed, accidents. And I asked my mother that, uh, how did he die to save the world, and the world was still going through the confusion and the problems that they were having. I saw people shot. I said, how did, if he died for the sins of the world, then why is the world still sinning? So no one can answer these questions for me. And I asked my mother again uh, at another time, I said, if Jesus was God, then how did he himself die? How could he be killed and he's God? And if he's God, how does he die and come back to life? My mother couldn't answer it. My father couldn't answer it. No one can answer it. Uh, later, I asked my parents about Christmas, the ritual that we celebrated every year on the 25th of December. And I asked my parents, if the Bible doesn't give Jesus a birthday, then why did we give him a birthday? And if he did have a birthday, why did we put up trees and, and what does Santa Claus have to do with this? And I remember at that time I told my parents, I said, I, I don't believe any of this stuff about Jesus anymore. I, I'm, I'm not going back to church anymore. Don't ask me. I'm not participating in any of this stuff anymore. Uh, my mother was uh, very upset with me. My father didn't say anything about it. He just shook it off and thought that I was just a young boy, that I would grow out of it. My mother took it seriously. She called all the old people in the family and they told her that, that a jinn or a demon had gotten into me and this boy was talking only because of a demon in him and that they should beat this demon out of me. So as a young boy, 10, 11, 12 years old, I certainly got into mischief. And every time I would get into mischief, my mother assumed that there was this demon that everybody had told her was in me. And she would beat me severely. I mean, really, really bad. And uh, she would punish me severely. She would tell me to go up into my room, stay in my room for the whole month. Summer would come, school would be out, the kids would be playing. She said, you can't come out till the summer's over. So while I was up in my room for the summers, I had a chance to contemplate. It's like uh, I could think. I was by myself. I would read books. But one of the things I used to always do was I would look out my window because everybody was outside and I'm locked up in the room. So my, my door to the world was the window. And as I would look out this window, I would see the creation. There was a big tree in front of our house. I noticed that this tree would be green in the summertime. And then in the fall, this same tree would be, uh, uh, the leaves would change colors. And then in the winter, the leaves would fall, the tree would be bearing. Then in the spring, it would come back. I observed all this from my room. I would look out my window and lay my head back and look up at the sky, and I would just try to count the stars. I could never count them. I would feel the wind on my face, and I noticed that every time I felt the wind, I see the clouds moving. Every time there was a wind, there was clouds, and these clouds would come. And then at some point in time, after these clouds would assemble, they would rain. And I said, whoever is controlling this wind, whoever is controlling these clouds, whoever is bringing this rain, whoever bring these trees back, whoever put all those stars up in space, that's God. This is what I knew as a 10-year-old, 11-year-old child. That's God. I understood that concept, but I didn't know about Allah, I just knew that Allah, this God had created the universe and was control of everything. Uh, I was in this state for some time and uh, my neighborhood, everyone in my neighborhood found out that uh, I didn't believe in Jesus 
and, uh, and thus I was ostracized from all the kids in the neighborhood. Nobody would play with me. The parents told their kids, you can't play with that boy. He doesn't believe in God. He doesn't believe in Jesus. So I had really very, very few friends from my own neighborhood because I had this stigma as being a, a child who didn't believe in God and I was an atheist. So I was uh, basically not considered a person that anyone wanted to be around. Uh, with this belief, a lot of people would tell me, the older people would tell me something was wrong with me. Something wrong with you, boy. You, you crazy. You done lost your mind. And after hearing this from so many people so much time, I kind of felt something was wrong with me. And I drifted and got into trouble. Uh, I hung out with the, the bad kids in the neighborhood, you know, because I had nobody else to play with. And I uh, kind of led a bad life. I got into trouble. I started uh, being uh, stealing and breaking into things and doing things that uh, were wrong. And even when I was doing these things wrong, uh, I didn't feel good about it, but I did these things. I got arrested from time to time, uh, but I never served any time in jail because I was so young, they couldn't believe that I was doing these things. Uh, and a lot of older people, uh, older kids were putting me up to this stuff. Here I am, 11, 12, 13 years old, and they were teaching me how to, to break into buildings. And what I knew at that time was I knew how to turn off alarms. I don't know how I knew how to turn off alarms. I don't know how I knew how to get in these buildings. I have no clue what gave me the, the, the knowledge of how to defeat these systems. But the, the older people would come and seek me out and say, we need you to help us to do such and such a, a job someplace. And we'd go there, they say, you make sure these alarms are off. And I would find a way to turn them off. And they would go in the buildings. And they would take all the goods out the buildings and uh, we would leave. So I did these things for a while. Never felt comfortable doing it, but I did these things. Uh, by the time I was 15 or 16 years old, I was in high school. And uh, the problem had gotten worse for me then because in the high school, there was a lot of social pressure on me because I had refused to participate in Christmas ceremonies. I refused to sing Christian songs. I refused to give gifts. I refused to participate in any of the pagan holidays that they had. I called it all wrong and I wouldn't partake of any of it. So the school officials had problems with me. One year, we had some visitors from another school who came to our school from Canada and uh, they asked questions about uh, things and I gave them answers that they didn't want to hear. One of the questions they asked me, they said that I'm 15 years old sitting in the classroom. They said, do you believe in God? I said, I don't believe in the God that you believe in. I told them like this. And they said to me, then this boy is an atheist. And I said, what God, they asked me, what God do you believe in? I said, I believe in the God that, that created the universe, but that's not the God you believe in. Like that, and I left it alone. I didn't know anything about Jesus. I didn't, I didn't know anything about Islam. I didn't know anything about religion, except a natural inclination to know that one God had created everything in the universe as was, was in charge of that universe. And that was the state I was in prior to uh, uh, my ascension to Islam, prior to Allah completely guiding me to Islam. And I stayed in this state until I was in my early 20s, knowing that there was one God, but not knowing the true nature of the one God and not knowing correctly how to worship this one God. Not knowing God, but always praying to this God that I didn't know to guide me to the real truth. This is what I knew and this is what I believed prior to my ascent to Islam. As I said earlier, I joined the military at 18 and I stayed there until I was 21. I joined the military to get out of the life of crime, to get out of the streets that I had been living this bad life. Still, I did not know Allah, but I joined this military for three years to train and study to give myself some skills that I could work at. When I came out the military, I came back home to find that some of my family members had now been involving themselves in drugs. And there was one guy living in my neighborhood that was selling drugs to my family. There was one female family member that had become addicted to drugs. I went to this guy after about a year of me being out and I told him, I said, look, I don't have a problem with you dealing drugs if that's what you choose to do. But I got a problem with you dealing drugs to my family. You need to stop. I told him like this. He promised me, no, 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 I'm gonna stop. I'm gonna stop, I'm gonna stop. And uh, I left it alone. Maybe six months later, I see and uh, noticed that he hadn't stopped. So I went back to him again. I said, look, man, I thought we uh, had an understanding that you were going to stop doing these drugs, uh, dealing drugs to my family and dealing drugs in this neighborhood. And he told me, he said, well, you know, the people in your family are grown. They can do what they want to do. I said, OK, thank you. And I left and walked away. Um, next time I saw him, I shot him five times in the chest with a 32 automatic. He fell to the floor and I thought that he was dead. And uh, just as I was about to, to leave the facility, he jumped up out of the floor and had a gun and he was shooting at me. 
and I don't know, I didn't even have time to think. I just ran up the stairs in the, in the, in the building we were in and, and I leaped through a, a window that was about five to six meters high. I just, the window's big window there and I just put my arms up in front of my face like this. There was a bar, a, a wooden bar across this window. I hit that bar with my arms and came out of this five meter window to the ground and started running. And uh, as I was going through this window, when I got up those stairs, something just said to me, just go, do it. No fear, just do it. So I went through the window. And when I got down on that ground and I, I'm thinking to myself, I should be dead, I should be hurt. I'm on the ground, it's like I floated to the ground and I was running. And I looked, I didn't have a scratch any place on my body, nothing, nothing, nowhere. I wasn't hurt at all. And I ran maybe four kilometers to my uncle's house. And when I got to my uncle's house, I called the police to report the shooting, all right? And I figured that uh, this guy was a drug dealer, so he was gonna kill me anyway. So the best thing for me to do was to take the offensive and call the police and, and turn myself in. So the police came, they put a, sent a SWAT team to arrest me. It was a Christmas morning. Whole team of police comes flooding the street to my uncle's house. I'm sitting on the porch with an orange in my hand. They, they all have guns pointing at me, get down, get down. So I get down on the ground, I'm laying down. I say, hey, it's just an orange, it's just an orange because I don't want them to make a mistake and shoot me. And uh, they arrest me. Now, when I'm in, in, in the jail there, uh, they charged me with assault with intent to commit murder. But I spent three hours in the jail and they said, we're releasing you. And I said, how are you gonna release me? You know, that uh, this guy, I just shot this guy. He's a drug pusher, he's gonna try to kill me. Say, oh, we know that. But uh, he said he didn't know who did it and it wasn't you, like that. So uh, one police officer told me, he said, uh, you need to get some protection because they're gonna kill you, just as plain and simple. When they released me, I told the police officer, look, you guys either charge me if you don't charge me, I'm leaving the city. They said, uh, well, we're gonna charge you. We're gonna put a warrant for your arrest. I don't care if you put a warrant for my arrest. If you don't charge me right now, I'm leaving the city. And I felt that had they charged me and put me in jail, I would have been protected from anything. And uh, uh, I left the, uh, before I left the city, I called uh, my brother and some friends and I found out that they had put some contracts out on me, two contracts out on me, one for $25,000 and one for uh, an ounce of heroin. And basically, they told me that every junkie in the city would be looking for me. So I was basically going to be a dead man because of this. So I left the city. And, uh, and again, what was in my mind when I left that city was not that I had shot this guy, and not so much that, 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 that my life was in danger, but how did I make it through that window without getting a scratch on me? This was what was in my mind. And I was saying to, to myself, I was saying, Allah, oh God, you, you saved me from this. Only you could have saved me for this. Please show me what it is you have for me. This was my prayer. Show me what it is you have for me. Uh, my family's gone, I'm broken from everything, I'm on the run from the police. I couldn't go no lower in life. I couldn't go no lower in life. I'm thinking that anybody, uh, uh, that somebody's gonna kill me uh, around every corner. There was no place for me to go. I said, Allah, God, whatever it is you have for me, I need it now. I need it now. So I traveled to a city called Pittsburgh. I didn't find any relief in this city. I uh, stayed there for one month and I traveled to a city called Memphis. I didn't find any relief in that city. I traveled to a city called New Albany. I didn't find any relief there. I did find solitude in New Albany because it was a small country town, no people, uh, just farmers and things like that I could think. And then I went to a city called Jackson, Mississippi, a city I'd never been in before in my life. Uh, when I got to this city, I was there less than a month and I was walking down the street that I don't know why I was walking down the street. I looked inside of a bookstore and I, and I saw a Mutawa. I can only say a Mutawa because of his dress and his long beard. And I backed up and I walked into the store and I said, excuse me, uh, what is your religion? This is the first thing I asked him. He said, we're Muslims. And I said, well, what do you believe? He said, we believe in, 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 in one God. And I said, and, and, and tell me more about this. Uh, and, and we follow the prophet Muhammad. I said, you talk about Elijah Muhammad? He said, no, no, no. We talk about Prophet Muhammad from 1400 years ago, who came to mankind with a message from Allah in the form of a Quran. And I said, well, can I have this book? <laughs> and they said, well, you can come to this masjid and we'll tell you, we'll give you, uh, we'll teach you what you need to know. He said that the masjid was at a, straight, a place called 1204 Jones Street. 1204 Jones Street. I still remember this after 30 something years. I walked from that building to that masjid that second and I sat on the steps until they opened for prayer. And I think I may have sat there for an hour. And when I walked inside, I knew I belonged there. Immediately, I saw some brothers come in, they offered Salah, they went to Sajud, and I'm like, wow. I just felt in my heart, this is where I belong. Uh, they talked to me about the religion of Islam 
and uh, they assigned one brother to, to work with me and to, to teach me. This brother's name was Rafiq, and Brother Rafiq gave me his Quran. He said, this is my Quran, I'm giving it to you to read. And when I started reading this Quran, uh, tears was in my eye. Uh, because I knew at that point that, that, that uh, la ilaha illallah, I knew it. What I, was remarkable to me was when I read the Quran where it talked about how Allah sends the, the, the winds to bring the clouds, to bring the rains, these things that I had witnessed in, in the creation and that he was the one God in charge of the entire universe and all things. These are things that had already been instilled in my heart and this I knew when I read the book was the book of truth. And immediately, immediately when I walked into that masjid, I took shahada and that began my life as a Muslim. Uh, then I was able to join the military again because I couldn't find a suitable job in this environment. So I rejoined the military, went to technical school, and Allah blessed me to be around a group of Muslims from the Middle East. Uh, there were Muslims from uh, Egypt, Saudi Arabia, Kuwait, Turkey, Nigeria, Sudan, all living in the community and functioning well. And I would go to the masjid and pray, and, uh, and I would detach myself from the society and be in the masjid all the time. When I, I was a young Muslim, I hadn't been a Muslim more than six months, and when I was in the masjid, Sometime I would fall asleep reading Quran or sometime I fall asleep reading Hadith. I see these brothers come in and I was sometime thinking I was doing something wrong because I'm sleeping in the masjid. They no, 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 no. And after some time, these brothers took me under their wing and they began to pick me up every single day, take me to their homes and give me the correct teachings of Islam and the correct Sunnah of Islam, who was also a Christian. I told him, I said, brother, just do me one favor. I was talking on the phone. I said, just do me one favor. He said, well, I said, just go to the masjid and listen. If you don't like it, walk away. Just go to the masjid and listen to what they have to say. He went to the masjid, he became Muslim. Uh, my friends that I grew up with, when, uh, when I came back to visit my family and my friends, they started trans watching me, seeing how Islam was applied in my life, seeing how my family was growing under Islam, seeing the cleanliness of my family, seeing how whole our life was, how complete it was, and they would come to visit and sometimes the, the kids would say, can we pray with you? Can we do this? I would smile and say, just, just watch and, and talk to your parents about it. And eventually those children that watched us grew up and became Muslims. Uh, they, when they got to the age of maturity, these children from being around my wife, myself and my family, they became Muslims. Uh, my children were Muslims. The kids that they were their friends became Muslims. Uh, and and they, they probably the, the greatest thing for me was that the mother who used to punish me when I, when I was a child, who said that there was a demon in me. One day I was at her house and she told me, she said, when you were a child, I used to think that the devil was in you. She said, now I know that God was guiding you to something that he didn't show any of us. And she said, I know from watching you today that the religion that you have is the right way and what you have given is the correct thing and she took shahada she said la ilaha illallah muhammadan rasulullah and my mother died as a muslim this to me was a big big victory my sister became muslim my brother-in-laws became muslims my friends became muslims uh, when i was in the military soldiers that worked for me became muslims uh, I, I can't count. If you ask me the number of people who, who a lot guided to Islam for me, I, I couldn't even give you a number. <laughs> وأشكو بحزن بقى يا أنيني زارعت هواك رحاب الحنايا لأجلك أيام عمري هدايا فسبحان من جاد مزن المطايا ليغدو أغلى يقيني يقيني إليك ستمضي دروب حنيني وسحر الأماني وعزف سنيني وأرسل مجاة طيف الليالي لشوق وأرجوك أن تسمع
and the thing that was important to me was when I was studying Islam at this point in time, I was studying the life of Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam and how he lived his life in Mecca. And what I saw with me living in the West was akin to the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam living in Mecca. And the dawah that he did to his family and the methods that he employed for dawah for his family was the same methods that I employed for dawah for my family. And those methods work. And the method was to be tolerant and to be kind to your family, whether or not they were Muslims. And this message is what brought my family towards Islam. And even to this day, I'm here in Saudi Arabia from the, by, by the grace and the mercy of Allah. But in my heart, I know that at some point in time, if Allah wills, that I must go back and complete this dawah with my family. Now, uh, another interesting side story is that uh, my family has been in the United States from my father's side for over 250 years. And we found out through, through DNA that my family was taken out of the, the nation of Cameroon. And they were members of the Fulani tribe. And the Fulani tribe is a Muslim tribe. It's the, the largest nomadic tribe in Africa and in the world for that matter. And that my father's ancestors before they were taken uh, were Muslims. And so to me, this is the complete victory that my ancestors were Muslims. They were taken out of Africa 250 years ago, brought to the shores of North America in, in chains and on slave ships. And then Allah guided me back to Islam. And today my family is on the path going back to Islam. This is a complete 100% victory for me and for my family. And this is a, a, a more proof to me uh, of Allah Akbar, that Allah is great. And I would implore all of my brothers and sisters that are listening to, to know that Islam is the correct guidance, that it is a blessing for us to, to, to have been chosen to be Muslims, and that uh, doing dawah and uh, having the conduct of a Muslim and, and setting the right examples is a very, very, very important part of our spiritual growth and development. And in my mind, I always believe that the best example for me uh, the best example of Islam was my character, my conduct to the non-Muslims. And it was with that ideal that I got from Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam watching him that uh, uh, inspired me. And this is what had guided me to have tried to have excellent conduct towards my family, to have excellent conduct toward the non-Muslims. And this is uh, my story about my transition to Islam. Inshallah, may Allah guide us all. May you all gain some benefit from what I'm saying. And may Allah guide us all. I mean, when I left the United States uh, to come to work in the Kingdom of Saudi Arabia, again, this was a, a blessing from Allah. Uh, I had uh, completed a school, an engineering school, a two-year course, and after I completed the course, excuse me, a one-year course, I had a one-year contract uh, with, to, to a two-year contract obligation to fulfill with the company to pay for my training. They spent over $100,000 for my training, and I had to stay with them for two years. While I was there, I met a person that I had known in the military 20 years earlier. And I saw him someplace and I said, hello, how are you doing? And uh, he told me, uh, he spoke back to me and I said, what are you doing these days? He said, I'm, I'm working in Saudi Arabia. I said, Saudi Arabia? What are you doing in Saudi Arabia? He said, I'm teaching. I said, what are you teaching? He said, I'm teaching communication electronics. I said, what who? What company? He gave me the information. Uh, he said, yeah, take, just give them a call. I gave this company a call. And uh, they uh, told me to send a resume. I sent the resume. They said, we have a job for you next week. You can go. But I'm thinking to myself, I still have this two-year obligation with, uh, with, the, with, the, with the company that sent me to school. So I told them, I'm sorry, I cannot take this job. I still have a two-year obligation with the company that I'm, I'm working for. And I can't come to your, your job. They said, OK, sorry. So in my heart, I was, in, I was broken because here was an opportunity for me to go to Saudi Arabia, but Allah has told us that we have to fulfill all contracts and obligations. So I couldn't break this contract to come to Saudi Arabia. Exactly, exactly two years from that date, this guy called me back and said, are you ready to go to Saudi Arabia? Exactly two years. He said, are you ready to go to Saudi Arabia? I said, Alhamdulillah, I'm ready. And so Allah provided a method for me to come to Saudi Arabia. So now I came here and uh, I'm on the plane, I'm, I'm just, just my heart, I just can't even describe what was going on inside of my heart with the ideal that I'm going to be living in a society of Muslims. I, I just, I just cannot describe it. 
And it was when I was saying, I was like, in myself, I'm not looking back. This is, this is a dream come true to me. This is the answer to my prayers. And I get to Saudi Arabia, and I'm thinking uh, how much I'm going to learn, how much I'm going to grow, how much spiritual development I'm going to have. Uh, th I'm thinking of my interaction with the Muslims. I have all these ideals in my head. And I get here, and, uh, the, I get here and, and Muslim brothers said, okay, after one week, someone said, hey, you haven't been to Mecca yet. I said, no. I said, come on, let me teach you how to do Umrah. Uh, a, a very, very good friend of mine prepared me for Umrah, took me to Umrah, and I'm standing here in front of the Kaaba, and I'm standing here instead at the Maqam Ibrahim. I'm standing here where, where Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam stood, and I, I couldn't believe the feeling. And my body just started shaking, and tears just started rolling down my eyes. I, I just, uncontrollably, I just wept like a baby and, uh, uh, at, the, at the experience, at the feeling of this. And I was doing my, my two rakahs, and they may have taken me a half an hour to complete these two rakahs because I couldn't stop crying uh, at, at, the, at the feeling of being here in Saudi Arabia and standing in front of the Kaaba, the house of Allah. I just couldn't stop. Uh, the, the transition here in Saudi Arabia has been a good transition. It's been a good uh, a period for me and a good period for my wife and a good period for my family and my children to grow up in this environment. For me, the, the, the part that, that inspired me, that, that, that I keep, there's so much of Quran that, that, uh, that, uh, that we can't contain at all, but the part of, uh, of the Quran that inspired me more than any was the part that says that the Muslims, you are the best people evolved for mankind. And I see the Muslim as the rightful caliphs of the planet, the rightful caretakers of, the, of humanity. I think what Allah has given us is what the whole world is supposed to have. And the solutions for all of mankind are contained within the Quran and the Sunnah of Prophet Muhammad. The other, the other thing that has inspired me is the, the hadith that Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu said that in whatever the Muslim endeavors, he seeks to perfect it. And so this has been something that I used when I was in the West, when I was in the military. Uh, it, it led me to excel at being a soldier. Uh, con continuously, I strove to be the best that I can be as a Muslim, the best I can be as a soldier, the best I can be to my family, the best I can be to, to everything because of this hadith, that whatever the Muslim endeavors, he, he seeks to perfect it. And I, so, I sought to do this, and I still seek to do this in all my endeavors. When I go to my work and to my job, I seek to do it. My work, I try to make it the best I possibly can. I repeatedly read and rewrite my lessons to find errors and delete them. I repeatedly critique myself. Uh, that part of the, the Quran and Sunnah is the part that I could do. And this is the part that I took to my heart. As far as the, the, uh, the long-term goals for me is to continue to grow and develop, uh, to, to open up some businesses, and hopefully these businesses will support my dawah efforts in the West because there's major work to be done in the West. And the work to be done in the West for dawah, uh, unfortunately, we, we need uh, Westerners to do it. We need people who are educated in Quran and Sunnah who are from the people to, to perform this dawah. And we need to have to have uh, businesses to support the dais. We have to have centers and activities to support new Muslims. Uh, one of the problems that we have in the West is that we are zealous about bringing people into Islam. But once a person takes shahada and says, La ilaha illallah, Muhammadan Rasulullah, we need to have systems in place, centers and activity centers for that person and for his family. Because we in the West battle against an ocean of disbelief. There's disbelief in the school system. There's disbelief in the television. There's disbelief in, in, the, in, in the community. There's disbelief when you walk out your door and go to the store. So when our children are growing up in that environment, the only cocoon that they have that teaches them Islam is the home. The home tells them Islam. But when they walk outside the home, everything in the surrounding environment says Islam is wrong. So what we have to do is change that view. We have to put Islamic centers that have uh, activities that are wholesome. And I would think at this time, everything else has failed in America, that, that non-Muslims will see the beauty of Islam and come to Islam. But we just can't have the ideal that we will give them shahada and they will become Muslims and then we will drop them off at the door. Ah, oh, they took shahada, kalas, leave them. No, we have to take them and create Islamic communities. In every community, they have to create their own Medina. And this is, I think, the goal that I'm striving for, uh, to educate myself here, to, to learn what I need to know. Here.